I'm going to give you a quick introduction to Clash, a, uh, a HDL not written in Python, uh, ah. for a change. Um, it's written in Haskell, and it started as a research project in 2009 at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. Um, it has spawned many publications since then and many uh, related topics uh, in that faculty. Um, in 2016, it became apparent that there was a commercial interest for Clash. Um, so the, the guy who worked on it and his professor, they set up a company and quit the university. And one year later, after graduating from uh, the University of uh, Copenhagen, I joined as, uh, as a software engineer. And for the last year, I've been working on the internals of the compilers themselves. Um, and writing small uh, toy circuits. So what is Clash? Clash is basically Haskell without general recursion um, because we don't know uh, how many iterations uh, some piece of code is going to do uh, and um, type size at runtime because we also don't know how big these types are going to be, uh, so we can't compile them down to some uh, to VHDL. Um, but the lack of this is amortized by uh, factors and dependent types, and um, which I will show in, a, in the quick introduction here. Um, Clash compiles down to three targets: uh, VHDL, Verilog, and System Verilog. Um, and if you want to add another one. Uh, you're welcome to do so because it's all open source licensed under VSD. Um, and we hope Clash offers all the high level features Haskell offers uh, without any, any overhead on the hardware level. Oh, wait. Right. So, the best way to introduce Clash, I think, is to just do uh, a small example. And in this presentation, we're going to build a very small CPU. Um, we'll keep the number of registers uh, open and we'll have it operate on arbitrary number types, so anything you in, uh, want to instantiate. And uh, it's going to be very simple in the sense that it doesn't do anything fancy, just uh, multiplication, addition, uh, and it executes exactly um, one instruction per cycle. So, this is what our CPU is going to look like. It's incredibly simple. Uh, we just have uh, a, a number of instructions on the left. Let me see if I can get this working. Yes. Uh, we've got a program counter, a decoder, uh, and the decoder uh, sends sub-instructions to the ALU and the program counter, resp respectively. Um, so. Let's first have a look at the instruction memory. Well, uh, what we're doing here is we're defining a type which will hold our instruction. And as we'll go on, we'll add options. And these options, they act like an enum, but with uh, some data incorporated into them. Um, oh, excuse me. Yeah. So, uh, data indicates that we're going to build a new data type. Instruction is the name of our data type. <coughs> N is the number of registers in our CPU. And num type is the type uh, of number we're going to operate on. So the first action our CPU can do is multiply. Um, it takes its arguments from a register uh, some register and another register and puts it into another register. Pretty simple stuff. Now, we'll do the same for add. Uh, and we'll also add an absolute uh, instruction. And you'll notice that um, not, every, not every option in this enum type has the same number of arguments. Uh, and that's just a possibility. We'll also add the option to insert a, a literal 
into some register to, to load our initial values. And of course, a jump, so we can jump anywhere in the program, so we can do loops. And I've hard-coded the integer 8 here, so we can have a maximum of 256 um, instructions, <coughs> but nothing is stopping you, of course, from adding it to this uh, parameter list. And what's a register? Well, it's basically a number which ranges from uh, 0 to n minus 1. That's what the index indicates. And Clash will actually enforce this. So now we've got our instruction type set up. Um, let's look at our, our decoder. What should it do? Well, first of all, it should send some instruction to the ALU. Um, and to prevent naming collisions with the previous data type, we add an accent. Um, and you'll notice that it doesn't have any arguments. It's just uh, a simple wire of uh, two bits here, uh, which can either be add, multiply, or absolute. And we'll do the same for the, the program counter. So it can either uh, oh. uh, it can either jump to some absolute address in the in the instruction memory, or it can just add one to the program counter. Pretty simple stuff. The decoder then, well, this is the name of the function. This, and I should say that all of what I'm writing here is just plain Haskell. There is, uh, you can compile it down to just the binary and run it yourself. And you could compile it with Clash and it would turn into VHDL or anything. So, what we're doing here is we're defining a function called decode. It takes in uh, the register bank and it pattern matches, which is kind of like a case select, uh, on, on add. And add had three arguments, so uh, we call them x, y, and z, z. And we'll return a tuple with uh, all the things we need to send out, which is, first off, the thing we need to send to the ALU, uh, add. Then the thing we need, we're sending to the program counter, which is just jump by one. And then the inputs to the ALU and the address we're actually writing to. We can repeat this process for multiply as well. Uh, multiply is actually exactly the same as add, uh, except for the fact that it's called multiply instead of add. Um, so the absolute value has something interesting. Uh, we're using undefined here which is also a possibility in Clash. So whenever the, the Haskell runtime would uh, encounter this, it would just crash. But um, Haskell is also a lazy, value, uh, a lazy language, which means that it won't evaluate it unless, you really, unless it really needs to. Um, and we'll set up the ALU in such a way that it will never touch um, that value if uh, if it gets an absolute, so it won't crash. Um, well, pretty simple stuff for the literal. We're uh, kind of abusing the ALU with the add uh, function, but in this way, we'll just write the literal x to registers z. <laughs> and of course, jump, where we'll see uh, another uh, undefined, undefined which it will write to register zero, which will define in a moment to all, always hold zero. So it doesn't matter what we write into it. And it simply says to the program counter, well, jump to, to address Z. So this is our whole decoder for the processor. Um, let's implement the program counter and the ALU. Also pretty simple stuff. Uh, we define a function which is called ALU. We pattern match on the thing we get from the decoder um, and, um, and the arguments we get from the decoder. And we'll basically say, well, add x plus y, multiply is x, multiply y, absolute is absolute x. Again, it seems like pretty simple stuff. Notice that we haven't used uh, any type signatures yet. So 
uh, clash will figure out itself what the type of this function is. You can add it manually, which sometimes helps uh, for clarity, um, but you don't have to. So I'd actually, I want to argue that Haskell is actually a pretty good language to, to do prototyping because you don't have to write the types, even though people think that's true. Um, and the program counter, even simpler than the ALU. Um, when you get suck, just add one to the program counter. When you jump to a specific instruction, well, the next instruction is going to be yeah. Simple stuff. Um, so let's tie it all together to, to form one processor. The way we're going to do this is that we're going to build a function which is given to a media machine. And um, so a media machine is basically uh, a function which takes a state and an input and produces a, an updated state and an output. Now we're not having any inputs because we don't do I.O. or anything. Um, so you'll notice that I use the underscore here. So the processor gets the instruction memory, which is just completely static. Uh, then the register bank as its state and the program counter as its state. Uh, yeah, and the input as nothing. And then it will uh, uh, return, again, a tuple, this tuple basically, with the updated register bank and the updated program counter. And it will uh, put out a result. And so we need to fill this in. What's the first thing we're going to do? Well, we're going to decode the instruction we get from the program counter. So first, we'll fetch the uh, instruction from the, the instruction memory, and we put it into the function decode together with the, the registers. And what we get out is that long tuple we defined earlier uh, with the, the right address, the, the values for x and y, which can be undefined depending on what instruction we're running. Um, the instruction for the program counter, the instruction for the ALU. Um, so we're just going to output because there is no sensible, real sensible uh, output for this process, but we're just going to act like the output of the ALU is a, it's a useful output. So we can simulate it in a, in a moment. And um, re we'll replace uh, the write address uh, with the result of the ALU. And we'll replace the zeroth uh, register by zero. And of course, we'll update the program counter. And this is actually our whole processor. So what do we do to, to simulate it in Clash? Well, first, we'll, uh, we'll use the, uh, the instructions we defined to make a little program. So this loads the literal 5 into register 1, uh, literal 7 into 2, and it adds register 1 and 2 together, and then it does that over and over and over again. So what we expect as an output is every time it runs uh, either literal, literal, or add, we should get an output to, uh, to our console. And notice that this is the, actually the first time we're actually saying uh, what type it should be, because this will be our top level function. So we, uh, uh, once we actually want to compile it down to VHDL, we have to force Clash uh, to choose a type, uh, or a monomorphic type, more specifically. And so we say, well, the instruction memory is a vector of, of four uh, elements. Oh, it's actually, oh no, no, it's four. Um, and it holds uh, instruction uh, with three registers. So we could just add one to this, and we would, we would have four registers or five. And it operates on 16-bit integers. We'll initialize our registers um, with 0, 0, 0. And finally, we'll say, well, um, the, the top level entity of, of our design is that function uh, given to a media machine. So we'll update continuously. Uh, this is not the only way you, would, you can program um, 
programs, but the media machine is really nice for small designs. Like this. And we'll actually say, well, the input, we don't really care. It's, uh, it's an empty tuple. So we open our Clash console. So we go to the console, we type uh, Clash uh, I, and the, uh, the Haskell file we did, it will take a few seconds, and then it has compiled it, and then we can run whatever is in that file. Uh, so we're actually running uh, kind of like an interpreter here. And we'll say, well, just show us uh, eight of the first results uh, from the circuit we built. And we'll say, well, well, you first load a five into the first register, a seven into the second, and then the adding starts. So five plus seven is 12. Then we get an undefined because we do a jump, so the uh, DLU doesn't do anything useful, and so on and so on and so on. So, the nice thing is about this is that it doesn't have to operate on 16-bit uh, integers. It can operate on anything, and not only the uh, not only the number types which Haskell by default recognizes as a number, but we could also say, well, you know what, Haskell, um, if I've got a a number which is known at compile time, and um, I've got some number a, then I know how to define the operations plus, uh, multiply, minus, and absolute for a vector of that length with that number type in it. And so we'll just say, well, plus is the pairwise uh, addition of all, the, uh, of all the numbers in the vector. Um, and you notice that this plus actually refers to the vector and this plus refers to whatever number type we define here. And we'll do the same for multiply, so pairwise multiplication, pairwise subtraction, which we actually didn't define in our instruction set, but whatever. Um, and uh, the same for absolute. So we just map over uh, all the elements in the vector and take their absolute value. And now we can run it again, simulate it again, but we've built a vector processor. And to really drive the point home that this is uh, uh, what you're writing by default is uh, polymorphic, and you can instantiate it with anything you like. Um, we can also do the same for matrices. So if we define plus, minus, and multiplication for matrices, suddenly we've built a processor which does uh, um, operations on matrices. And I think that's the most beautiful thing about Clash, that you're writing these general circuits and you can instantiate it with, with anything you like. So, conclusion. Uh, we've built a small CPU that handles any, uh, any number type and we can define our own number types. Um, we've used our own data types uh, to define an internal instruction set and we've actually used that as uh, kind of an assembly language. And now you're thinking, well, this is a super simple design. Can I actually make uh, good designs with Clash, complicated designs? And uh, yes, you can actually. Um, so the version that's out now, uh, 0.99, um, we offer an interactive REPL. We do multi-clock design with type-safe clock domain crossing. So you won't ever make mistakes there again, hopefully. Um, or it's a bug. And uh, we do cycle-accurate uh, simulation, and we do all the stuff Haskell has. So the dependent types, which we implemented our, ourselves uh, for a large part, uh, higher order functions, partially applied functions, all that kind of stuff we do. Um, the version that's out on, on GitHub right now has some additional functionality, uh, which we, we built last year. Um, we have synthesizable and simulatable inline Verilog. Um, so you can actually drop in just Verilog into your Haskell code and it will just run in simulation and it will synthesize. Um, we've added bidirectional ports 
uh, we do VC dumps uh, for uh, for the signals you make, um, and we can do user-definable bit representations of the ADTs. So, um, if you think back of the instruction set we we defined, we didn't actually control what the bits uh, look like on a hardware level. With this new feature, uh, we can say we can tell Haskell to to use a certain um, bit representation and, and flash as well. And we've actually managed to, to do great speed ups uh, for the next release. So Clash would be um, a lot faster for you guys, hopefully. And for version 1.0, we plan a stable API. And nothing much yet. So thank you. And I'll take your questions now. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, so very interesting. Um, uh, and I'm always interested in different ways of describing architectures in functional languages, because it's a useful way to go. Your last slide, you talked about cycle accurate simulation. Right. But I didn't see anything that told me about how you explain the cycle behavior instructions. Because you were describing the ISA, but your cycle accurate behavior is going to depend on in the real world, how that's implemented. Have you got a pipeline or not? You know. Uh, uh, sorry, could you repeat the last? So, you said you do a cycle accurate simulation. Right. The number of cycles an instruction takes uh -huh. will depend on how you end up at the low level right. implementing it. And I didn't see anything where you were saying about, hey, I've got a pipeline, I'm overlining, lapping my instructions, yeah. or actually, I haven't got a pipeline and every instruction takes three, four, or five cycles. Um, so no, actually, um, we implement it in such a way that uh, like the whole processor tick takes one cycle. Uh, and we didn't say anything uh, about pipelining and stuff because it's too, too difficult for this presentation. Does that make sense? Yes, I think it means what you've got is you've got an instruction accurate simulation. Not, you've got an instruction set simulator. It'll tell you how many instructions you've executed, but right. it won't give you any insight into how many cycles that will take once you want to put it onto real silicon? Um, well, you just need to run the clock slowly enough in order for it to, to do this. Stuff. <laughs> with, with any design you make, you have to do that. This is not so, this is really RTL. Yeah, so this is, exactly. This is a single stage process, right? This is a single stage process. Exactly, okay. yeah. So, and you could build more complicated designs, of course, but I can't do it in a in a 15 minute talk, so, yeah. And I think you said this, but I just want to clarify, all of the code you showed us was ha Haskell, and Clash does all the behind the scenes magic to turn that into uh, an HDL. Yes, exactly. So we actually use the standard uh, Haskell compiler, uh, GHC, to compile it down to Lambda Calculus, and then we take that Lambda, lambda Calculus and turn it into uh, whatever representation we'd like. So we get all the optimizations from GHC as well. And if a new feature is added to, uh, to Haskell, more often than not, it compiles down to the same Lambda calculus. So we support all those things automatically. Yeah, um, so I'm using Clash. I'm using Clash to formally verify Verilog code against Haskell models by converting the Haskell models with Clash to Verilog and then running them through my tools. Cool. Um, but that means the uh, Haskell code that I'm working with is not really meant to be synthesized in many cases. Right. Um, sometimes that means I get a lot of error messages, a lot of Haskell packages are not really supported through Clash. That's okay, I can work with that. Yeah. But then sometimes it takes like gigabytes of memories and hours of CPU time to create a ridiculously small circuit. Um, and I have no way to figuring out what part of the huge Haskell model is causing that kind of issues. So are there some kind of debug functionalities that I'm not aware of that would allow me to give, to find out what part of the Haskell model is causing this kind of problems? Um. We're usually using just this GHC profiler. 
uh, to generate stats about those kinds of, of things. But if you'd like and your, uh, the things you're developing aren't closed source or anything, maybe you oh, can... Yeah, okay. Well, maybe you can make a, make a bug report about it, because we're very interested in those kinds of things. Because the Clash compiler, as of now, although we've done speedups, um, does have problems with certain types of partial application and stuff. Hopefully, just a very quick question. Uh, you mentioned the fact that it can handle multiple clock domains. Does the tool actually put in its own logic to actually then transfer data across clock domains, or do you still have to still describe that? Um, you still have to describe it. So you, so you do need to explicitly say, like, um, I've got two signals from two different domains and I want to do something with them to turn it into some other thing, right? Yeah. But then the, the typing guarantees that that's more or less correct as long as we didn't uh, fudge up. Another question. Uh, is there much support for like uh, equivalence checking, like formal? Um, well, we're not doing that as a company, but Haskell is pretty known for having all these uh, formal tools and being like a playground for it. Um, so you could look around, but we're not doing anything like that right now. Okay, then I thank the speaker again. Thank you very much.